we welcome you tonight to our Christmas Eve service. We are glad that you came and joined us on this cold night. If you do not have communion elements or candles, they are available in the uh, vestibule and there are deacons out there who will assist you in making sure that you have them. Would you pray with me? God who created and is creating. On this Christmas night, we give thanks for the wonders you have created. For the warmth of family and friends gathered around a table. For twinkling stars and the bright moonshine in the crisp winter air. For all the gifts we have received that make life full. We wait with hope for what is being created for the wonders we have yet to see. Creator, open our eyes to see what you are doing in our midst. Open our souls and hearts that we would embrace the kingdom proclaimed by the babe in the manger. For God of hope and promise, as we sing the old songs and tell the old story, we know that the world is not what it could be or should be. Too readily we see the darkness and shadows of the world. Renew and restore our hope. Open our eyes to see the possibilities. Reveal to us the ways that people like us are choosing to make a difference. Shine light, O oh God, on the places where the promise of Christmas still is becoming reality. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night when Jesus was born, there were only a few to take notice. Mary was there, Joseph was there, some angels scattered around the manger, a group of ragtag shepherds came in. At some point, wise men came. But by and large, it was a very small setting gathered around the, the birth of, to recognize the birth of the Savior that day. How amazing it is to think that on this night, millions of people are gathering in churches and gathering in, around nativity scenes in their homes to worship the birth, of, to worship the baby who was born. Tonight we are part of a very large congregation gathering to adore Christ the Lord. Let's stand and sing together, A Little Town of Bethlehem and Away in a Manger.
children come forward for the children's sermon. I think it might just be me. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about light tonight. And light is something that, oh, come on, Scarlett, come on up. Hey, how are you? Your dress is beautiful. I'm so glad you came up here to keep me company. So have you ever had one of these before? Yeah. What is it? It's a light up bracelet that, you, that lights up. Yeah, they light up, don't they? Hey, come on up. Come on. I think we got lots of friends coming. Eliza, right over here. Eliza, right over here. Hey, come on over. Join Sissy and brother. There you go. There you go. Well, I'm so glad you came up. Yeah, you can sit. Here, I can move over so you guys have some more room. There you go. Look at that. Okay, so I'm going to give you guys some glow sticks here. And do you know how you make a glow stick light up? Do you guys know how you make a glow stick light up? You have to crack it. That's exactly right. You have to crack it, okay? So we're going to crack our glow sticks, and we're going to see what happens, okay? Can you crack them? Do you need some help? Can you crack it? Can you go like this? Oh, Like you're going to try and break it, and then look what happens. Is it glowing? Good job. Look at that. Do you see it glowing? Yeah, yeah, we see lots of them glowing. You know, when Jesus came, which is what we're celebrating at Christmas, the Bible tells us that he brought light. Now, these aren't glowing super bright right now, but I bet if we just stood back in the aisle, would they glow brighter? Why? Because it's much more darker. It's much more darker there. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And so if we took our lights back there, they might not make such a big light here because we've got all these lights. But when we take our lights, even though they look so little, out into the darkness, they light up the darkness. And that's what Jesus did when he came to earth, and that's what he wants us to do. Do you guys think you can light up the darkness with your lights? Let them shine for Jesus? Yeah. Okay, we're going to light the Christ candle tonight to remind us that Jesus came— to bring light to a dark world. And now we've lit all of the lights on our Advent wreath, and it brings more light than it did when we had none lit, or when we just had one lit or two lit. Now that we have all of them lit, our world is much brighter, just like when Jesus came. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for sending your Son and help us to share our light with others just like you shared our light with your light with us. For we ask all things in thy son's name. Amen. Thank you guys. You can go back to your seats. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to John 1. Would you pray with me? O 
Oh God, on this dark night, may the light that illuminated the darkness of Bethlehem's manger, the light that came out of nowhere to shepherds watching their flocks, a light that was so powerful it guided philosophers from afar off and brought them to the light in the manger. May that light shine a great, greater than ever before into our hearts this night. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Earlier this year, I read something about John that I find amusing and to me fits the perfect way to talk about what is referred to by scholars as the prologue of John. See, if you read John's gospel and you compare it to the other three, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the other three look something like the Kingston Trio. It's just the facts. It's very straightforward. No flash, no pizzazz. Just there it is. When you come to John, though, John is like the Elton John of the gospel writers. It's a big show. And he says things that just doesn't make sense. He is so mystical and esoteric, like here in the beginning, where he says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. I mean, you look at it and you go, what on earth is he talking about? He's talking about optics. Optics. Christmas optics, if you will, because this is the closest that John gets to a birth narrative. We think a lot about optics, though you might not think we do, or you might not think you do. But you think of how things are presented in the light. You think about how light does things. You think about it every time you try to figure out whether or not to use an Instagram filter as you post a selfie that you just took. You think about it in terms of what people will say or think about you if you bring to light some part of your personhood. Will they talk about you? You know, light is at the center of our planning for this service. There's a reason why we have worked on which lights are on, which lights are on when, when the lights go off. Why? Because it's all about optics. And so when we come here into John's prologue, which is what these opening lines of John's gospel are called, what is it about the study of Christmas optics that makes what the birth of Jesus declares so much more illuminating and enlightening? Well, first, we see the power of light. Verse number five says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. And we read these lines, and we think that John wrote them some 1,900 years ago, and so maybe that was the case back then. But, beloved, understand something. When the Scripture writer here tells us the light shone in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, that means that the power of the light of God has never been overcome by the darkness. 
I'll tell you right now that I confess that sometimes the darkness of this world seems to be about to overcome everything. But it doesn't. The light still shines. It has the darkness, in other words, is not capable of snuffing out the light. And that light is so bright that as Eliza just stated, the darkness cannot overcome it no matter how small it is. A light in the midst of a little tiny room that is pitch dark will bring all sorts of illumination to you. Beloved, tonight we come together and celebrate the fact that light has never, will never, shall never be overcome by the dark. That even on our deepest and darkest days, the light of God, that who is Jesus Christ, the light of the world, still shines into our hearts and brings us a path that we can make our way through. The light is powerful. The light is so powerful, in fact, that it is not just simply self-contained, but John tells us that the light empowers other things. Notice verse number 12 of the text. But to all who did receive him, that being Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. The light is so powerful that once we receive it into our souls, it empowers us to be something that we ourselves can never manage to be. You see, though we are created in the image of God because of our very fallen natures, that image becomes broken. We are com com created to be in communion with God, and yet Paul will tell us in his letter to the Ephesians that we spend our lives at war with God. He'll say to Rome that, that he does things that he doesn't want to do, that his nature is completely at war within him, that that which he wants to do, he cannot do, and that which he doesn't want to do, he does. And yet, the light, John tells us, if it is received and welcomed, empowers us to be what we were created to be. It empowers us to be in communion with God. It empowers us to be restored again, that there is no brokenness in us that mars our ability to be seen in the image of God. But that there is a full restoration that we can now be who we were created to be. So often it is that we think that we are created to be this, we are created to be that. But at the very base of all things, beloved, is the fact that you and I were created to be in communion with God. To give God glory. To know who He is and dwell in the fullness thereof. We do not have that power apart from allowing the light to come into us. Notice the end of verse number 13. Who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God giving us light through his grace allows us to be who we are intended to be. And we can try, we can hope, we can wish. But until we let the light come and shine in the midst of our own personal darkness, we will never ever get there. And so it is even better that we recognize that the light has a restorative empowerment to it because it empowers us to see what is always before us, but we miss. Verse number 14 of John 1 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, 
and we have seen his glory, glory of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Eugene Peterson has a, his own translation of this verse, and he puts it this way. He says, The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I like that. The Word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Now, we should understand that the neighborhood is not two doors down. You know, I think about our neighborhood, and I think about the fact that it is two doors down. I think about the fact that I know the neighbor to the left of me, and I know the neighbor to the right of me, but most of the time I can't always remember their names. In fact, the neighbor to the left of me, I put out his garbage, he puts out my garbage, and I, uh, or I bring back his garbage can and he brings back mine. Whoever does one does the other. But for the life of me, all I can ever remember his name is Grandpa Joe. You know, we, we're serving each other, but, you know, it's, it's not in the neighborhood, Right? And you say, well, Mark, Jesus, when he became flesh, didn't move into Rose Petal Way. He didn't move into my house in Elon or my house in Burlington. He moved in originally there on that third manger on the right in the cul-de-sac on the road to Egypt outside of Bethlehem. You'd be correct on that particular instance. But now the neighborhood in which the Word now dwells and makes His home is mine and your hearts. That is the neighborhood in which He dwells. And as Jesus moves into the neighborhood, you and I are empowered to see through our gaze something clearly. Grace and truth. For you see, these Christmas optics that I have spoken of tonight are such that through grace and truth, the ability to see that, the empowerment to see that through these Christmas optics, we can actually see clearly and forthrightly for the first time ever. We can see what really is the truth, that we can't do anything on our own strength or our own power but we can have to do everything through and with the grace of God hence it is why Jesus comes full of grace and truth the scripture tells us here it's why in verse number 17 we are told that grace and truth come through Jesus Christ it doesn't say that grace and truth come through other means though sometimes we can stumble upon truth in other places but beloved it is very difficult to stumble upon grace without Jesus you can have one without the other but beloved understand it's always going to be incomplete Herod had truth the king had been born in Bethlehem is what the wise men were to tell him but he did not have the grace to come and worship. And so tonight I return to something that I spend an enormous amount of time dealing with and discussing. And that is that yes, the light, the light that shines in the darkness and the darkness doesn't overcome it, empowers us to see truth. But the light also empowers us to see extravagant and abundant grace and because the light shines into the darkness and the darkness does not overcome it beloved that means that truth will always prevail but above all else it means that grace wins grace wins it's why verse 16 tells us that we are granted grace upon grace by Jesus Extravagance is the only way that we can think of and speak to this moment of Christmas optics. 
because extravagance is the only way you can describe this night. The creator of it all throws off all glory to take the form of the created, that they, the created, may through the light see the truth and grace, may experience the undeserved yet all-flowing favor of God. We will soon hear that this is a holy night. We will say this is a holy night. But beloved, what makes it holy, in other words, what sets it apart, is the fact that it is a lit extravagance. My dear, dear friend Benjamin Overby sits on the back row tonight wearing a Clark W. Griswold Chicago Blackhawks jersey. For those of you who have not ever seen this great Christmas movie that ranks up there with anything you've ever seen, there is a beautiful scene where Clark finally is able to turn his lights on. And much like Duke Power today, all the other lights around it go off. And they have to click in the nuclear generator. And it is so bright it blinds people. It, it blinds the, the nice people next door who are not celebrating the Christmas season. It is so extravagant. Beloved, that's why the light can't be overcome by the dark. Because the grace of God can't either and it's extravagant and it never burns out. That's why I think before all time God uses light to talk about His Son. That's why the very first thing that God creates, or I should say that Jesus creates in the beginning, because all things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made, we're told here in the opening lines, the very first thing that is made is what? Light. Light is given to us to make us understand how bright it is and to help us to understand that it never burns out and neither does grace. And it should flow from us just like it flows from Clark Griswold's house. A dear friend of mine who's a pastor called me last night. And he said, I think I'm run out of communion self-contained communion cups do you have some I can borrow now first off I'm not sure how you borrow self-contained communion cups it's like borrowing sugar but secondly I said to him no but I can tell you where you can go find what we use and he said well, I can figure this is probably going to be good now. I said, it is. I said, we brown bag it at Grove Park. You do what? We brown bag it. I said, everyone who comes to Grove Park gets a 10-ounce bottle of Welch's grape juice, and they get a little Ziploc bag with a king's Hawaiian roll. And he said, why do you do that? And I said, I'm glad you asked. Because the grace of God is extravagant. And the table that signifies his grace should not be anything but extravagant. It's why we put up so many blessed lights right that's why we've got lights hanging from wreaths it's why we've got lights in the windows it's why I've got little lights outside of my house I've got a blow up Mickey Mouse lit a blow up Minnie Mouse lit and a giant black Santa lit up in front of my house I did have Dominic the Elf but he exploded but he too was lit. That may have been why he exploded. Um, because this season's all about light. 
Because light shines in the darkness. And beloved, when Jesus tells us, let our light so shine before all mankind that they may see our good works and give glory to our Father who is in heaven, he says not that we go do anything special. He just says, go show the world grace and truth. Be like me, he says, because I am full of grace and truth. And so, beloved, I'm going to ask you something that is going to sound a little harsh, but I apologize, but not really. Are you a little dim tonight? I am. I am. I readily admit to you. I am. But there's another passage of scripture that says that a flickering candle he will not snuff out. And a bruised reed he will not break. And so I invite you to come to table, to the table of extravagance tonight, as I will, and feast. Because this is optics right here. We want to show the world that there is abundant and extravagant grace. And to do so, we first must act on it. It is how you will not be half lit or dim, but it's how you'll leave on this old holy night bright, 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 full, as full as you can be, just like Jesus of grace and truth. Oh, 
We come now to the table of the Lord. Prayerfully, joyfully, reflectively, we gather at this table. You really have no clue how much I enjoy listening to you do that. At this table, God invites us all to share in the banquet of life. The meal we share is provided by God. For this table belongs to Him, not to the church, not the people. And so God Himself invites all those who seek to walk in the way to eat and drink from it. Come and taste the grace eternal. Come and see that God is good. Would you bow your heads for grace? God of hope, sometimes hope is scarce. Soaring inflation tightens our budgets. Flu and COVID and RSV strain our health system. Our daily news so often brings despair. 
As Christ comes round again, help us see the hope found in a baby. A baby who will change, renew, revitalize our lives and our world. God of peace, tonight we mark the birth of one called Prince of Peace. He is born again into a world where we hear of mass shootings and warfare in Ukraine and Yemen and too many other places and domestic violence shelters that are full to the brim and people on our streets struggling with poverty and health and addiction. And we ask, where is the peace? As Christmas comes around again, help us all to see how peace and justice are possible. Transform us to be people who actively work to make them grow around us so that we can echo the angel song of peace on earth, goodwill to all. God of joy. Sometimes joy is absent. When worry and stress take over our lives, when there is an empty spot at the table, when grief is still raw, when we are afraid, it is hard to sink into the joy of the Christmas season. As Christmas comes round again, remind us of the joy that goes deeper than happiness, the joy of knowing that you walk with us, that you will always be with us, the joy that comes with an abiding sense that somehow, someday, all will be well again. God of love, lovingly break into our lives sharing all that we do and are and will be. You challenge, command, convince us to live lives guided by hope, guided by love, love for family, for friend, for stranger, for enemy, for neighbor, where we miss the chance to act lovingly, forgive us, and move us to be better next time. As Christmas comes round again, fill us with the dream of a world where love is the universal rule of life. Fill us with the love that casts out fear. And may that love overflow from our hearts into everyone we meet, so that as people of love, we may help build a renewed and revitalized world. God of birth, tonight we gather to celebrate a birth that happened long ago the birth of a child laid in a manger. But in the night we also celebrate births that happen every day. We sing praises for hope born anew in the midst of despair. We watch as people, as peace is born in the middle of violence and struggle and disparity. We listen as joy is born afresh in the brokenhearted. We are overcome with emotion as love is born time and time again, overcoming fear and distrust and hatred. We stand in the glow of tiny sparks that give birth to a light that warms and illuminates the wonders of life. For all the births we celebrate this night, we offer prayers of thanksgiving and praise. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God, for it is right to give our thanks and praise. Yes, it is right to give our thanks and praise. Praise to God, for Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, as we prepare to dine at his table, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Would you join me in prayer? Lord of light and hope, our minutes and hours have been swallowed up in preparation for this night and for the coming day. We have been so caught up in the preparations for gatherings and gifting that we have pushed aside the wonder of what you have done for all creation. 
Forgive us when we so easily get entangled in our own plans and forget to pay attention to the true event. Help us to relax and listen instead of rush and shout. May the songs of the angels, the surprise of the shepherds, and the joy of the holy family become part of our preparations in our lives. Open our ears, our eyes, our hearts, and our spirits to again hear the old, old story spoken by new voices in new ways. Remind us again of your never-changing love for us. Prepare us to serve you by serving others. This night we offer this prayer of our hearts to you, O gracious God. Amen. We are told in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Isaiah reminds us that I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Therefore, as Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins, to all those who with sincere repentance and true faith turn unto him, let us rejoice in our forgiveness. On the night that he was betrayed, Christ our Lord met with his disciples for a final Passover meal. And while they were dining, he took bread and he broke it and he said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Let us pray. O oh Lord, as we partake of this bread, may its significance grow afresh in our life that we would understand afresh. Emmanuel, God with us, that you took on flesh, Lord, to bear all our sorrows, to bear all our griefs, that there is never a thing that we can face in life that we cannot call to you and know that we have one who has likewise experienced it themselves. And that in you we may find perfect peace and hope and grace to strengthen and sustain us through each day. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for me and you. And then he took the cup. And after giving thanks, he said to them, Take and drink from it, all of you. For this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us pray. Lord, we've talked a lot tonight about optics, but we hold in our hands chemistry. We hold in our hands the chemistry of the fact that if we were to pour this out, it'd go everywhere. So too, Lord, does your grace... And as we partake of the cup, Lord, may it flood into every broken place that is in our hearts and in our souls. That through the strength of your grace, through the strength of your grace, we may feel forgiveness to know that nothing can separate us, nothing can hold us back. Nothing, Lord. that you have freed us from all and that we are sons and daughters of God. For it is in Jesus' name we offer our prayer. Amen. The blood of Christ given for you. The blood of Christ given for me and you.
earlier, Liza said to Scarlett and Eliza and Aiden that no matter how little the light was, it shines. We're going to make sure we understand that tonight. That's why we've cut all of it, all the lights off, except for these. It's why, you know, sometimes light can be loud. And so we're not going to have organ or piano. We're just going to have our voices piercing the dark as we pass the light of God's grace one to another and we sing a silent night so would you stand as we sing and I'll bring light to you silent night holy
preach the AccuWeather was on the bottom of the screen and it said if I read right 21 degrees outside you know if you hold your hand close though it gets warm doesn't it that's one of those things about light I didn't talk about it's another reason for you to go into this dark night and shine bright because you need to go warm somebody else's life. And so, with the heartiest of happy Christmases, I tell you to go outside and be light, and be bright, and be empowering that others may know truth and grace. And now, a little word about tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning we're still going to have church at 10 o'clock. Now some of you may have just opened your presents, particularly if you have young children. Guess what? They can come in their pajamas. They can even bring a toy. If someone complains near you, remind them that Jesus said that the kingdom of God is received as a little child. I'm not going to wear my Christmas pajamas. <laughs> I sent a picture to Benji and he said it was not a wise idea. I've looked forward to for three years to joining you all for this service. So hear me as I say, go like your world. If you'll hold, we'll turn a light on for you in the vestibule. Don't go anywhere fast, but receive now the benediction. In the grace and truth of the light of Bethlehem's babe, may we go forward from this place sustained in his mercy, empowered in his love, overcome by his joy and his hope that we, like him, may bring peace to our world. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.